I understood you were looking for a hot singer. The only hit that comes out of a Helen Lawson show is Helen Lawson. And that's me, baby. Remember? That's right. And we'll be talking about you, baby, in the latest episode of the Top 10 Favorite. And from what I believe are the best performances of some of the greatest actresses in all of cinema. With a song in my heart. I am starting from 10 and then drinking. Water. All the way up to number one. And always remember, folks, I have seen every picture attainable of these artists. So every list here comes from truthful, sensual, passionate accuracy. Today, folks, as November comes to an end, I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about one of the greatest actresses that never really gets her due, quite frankly. She is the magnetic, the honorable, and majestic Susan Hayward. Born as Edith Mariner in Brooklyn, New York, the youngest of three, she always had an itch for performing. Significantly, when she was seven years old, Edith was hit by a car, suffering a fractured hip and broken legs that put her in a partial body cast. Doctors at one point said she wouldn't be able to walk again, but after six months, she was able to walk again. However, the bone setting left her with a distinctive hip swivel later in life. With her gorgeous looks and dynamic presence, she was influenced to act professionally, but got her major start in modeling. But one lucky break of only auditioning for the role of Scarlett O'Hara in the popular film Gone with the Wind when she was only 20 years old gave hope to a promising career signing on with Warner Brothers, changing her name to Susan Hayward. Modeling continued with pinup photos since, like most actresses newly signed on with Warner Brothers, she was practically shoved under the rug. That's when Paramount Pictures comes to play. And once the production of Beau Jest arrived, she was able to get a certain role to increase her visibility, which was not hard to do because once you laid eyes on Susan Hayward, you couldn't take them off. Susan Hayward, without a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most underrated actresses in cinema, surely. She was one of those artists that came and simply did the work. Many of her co-stars have stated issues working with Susan Hayward based in very little communication and coldness from the actor. And we can certainly default to Susan being a diva, etc. which, hey, we can't deny there was some diva action happening for her in later years. But once you understand her Hollywood life, her actions on set could certainly bleed into it. Plus, look at the monumental roles she took on, majority of them having a vice, challenge, illness, and pain running their lives. Now, obviously, the lot of her career was also filled with joy, with laughable moments, just as they should. And throughout all the ebbs and flows of her Hollywood story, she still retained the greatest trait an artist can retain, strength. So bottoms up, my friends, and let's get going on the top 10 best performances of the vastly inspirational Susan Hayward. Starting off at number 10, we have House of Strangers, a quietly fantastic film which has been described as a film noir sometimes. And I can see that with its beautiful photography, but it's more of a family drama about the destruction of a family with Susan Hayward caught up in the middle, wanting to save the family, but more so save Max Monetti, the well-to-do lawyer son of the family played brilliantly by Richard Conti. Very underrated he is. Her character is very much in love with Conti, even though he's against it. And we see their chemistry quite alive in this piece, being the first of two times they would work together. But Susan Hayward receives second billing here after the great Edward G. Robinson, and she has a phenomenal scene with him that goes to show how strong of an actor she was against so many heavy hitters. The story itself is so powerful that it would later be remade into the Oscar-winning Western Broken Lance and The Big Show. But this, in my opinion, is the superior. Thanks to Joe Mankiewicz's direction and script. But the ensemble is just superb. And Susan Hayward was always that special glue that held a strong ensemble together. You can tell she was still part of an ensemble and she respected that, which is why she is absolutely loved and cherished because at the end of the day, Ugh, she loved telling stories. Number nine, Adam had four sons. 
the 1941 obscure classic with Susan Hayward making her big, big break and impact with her performance as Hester, the gold-digging wife of one of Adam's sons, David, who was away at war. Beaujess was really her first big exposure, as I said earlier, sure, but Susan really gets to sink her teeth into this vicious kind of character who manipulates and cons her way into the all-American family, ran by the governess Emily, played well by Ingrid Bergman, who sees between Hester's bullshit. Susan goes for it as Hester, even when her character seduces Jack, her own brother-in-law, with that dazed and lackadaisical wild giddiness she did so damn well. It was a supporting performance that really took notice by audiences and critics alike, and quite honestly being the best thing about the whole picture, because the picture itself is really quite forgettable. It, it really is. It's always amazing to see artists like her go toe-to-toe -to -toe with big-time stars, once again, like Ingrid Bergman, and practically steal the show from her. Susan Hayward revs up this picture in something much more interesting, which thus moved her career deservedly to bigger acclaim. Number eight, The Lusty Men. Man, this should be higher. I, I know it should, because this classic film, featuring the magnetic pairing of Susan Hayward and Robert Mitchum, has been classified by many as a bona fide masterpiece. And who can argue with that, having been directed by Nicholas Ray and its quality cast? Susan is the wife of Arthur Kennedy here. Again, another very underrated actor, and he wants to own his own ranch. And he thinks winning rodeo matches will get him there. So he hires retired rodeo champ Jeff, played by Mitchum, to get him there, against the wishes of Hayward, who becomes disenchanted by the whole business. You can almost say Scorsese's The Color of Money has a flavor of this film, and what gives its edge is the conflict of Hayward's character. They're all going through inner conflict and driving it on their own, really. But more of the empathetic conflict comes from Hayward, who wants to protect her husband, but at the same time wants success and happiness. And the beauty about Hayward is that she may have played a lot of characters that were supportive companions, but they were never without nerve never without strength. I know that term women of strength gets thrown around a lot these days, but Susan Hayward really was that, and she was able to bring that out in subliminal ways as Louise here, in top billing. The chemistry she has with Mitchum and Kennedy is just as strong and really makes this film work on another level that I find myself watching it over and over and over. Number seven, The President's Lady. This one might be a surprising entry for you folks, but I certainly don't think so. For this little Oscar-nominated hidden gem is brought to life by the strength and fire in Susan Hayward as Rachel Donaldson Robards, the daughter of a farm owner who meets the young attorney general of Tennessee named Andrew Jackson, played by Charlton Heston, in one of his better performances, actually. The film is obviously progressed by its scandalous love story, between the two and how Rachel empowers the would-be president of the United States. You want to talk about a surprisingly good film, even though factually it's a bit all over the place, of course, but thanks to the leadership of its stars, especially Susan Hayward, who was the pro, showing Heston the ropes practically. Heston had said Hayward led by example as a pro for him. That was very inspiring. He said, and I quote, as she made her character a woman of flesh and blood, a true frontier girl, a passionate wife, and a devoted companion. That's the best Charlton Heston I could do, folks. But I'm still working on it. But I go further in saying she was a woman of fiery independence who happened to be in love with Andrew Jackson. Fox originally wanted Gregory Peck and Olivia de Havilland to play the two leads, but there was no better cast than Hayward and Heston in these roles. Hayward even said herself that her performance here was a favorite of hers, for it was one of the best of her quote-unquote gentle roles. Number six, Valley of the Dolls. Now, I'm sure this is a performance for folks that should be rated much higher and at the same time a performance rated much lower <laughs> because of the pure display and definition of camp this performance and film embodies. But ladies and gentlemen, that's why it deserves to be here. For a film and performance that's universally panned by most critics and loved 
by audiences. In this cult classic based on the famous novel by Jacqueline Susan, Hayward plays Helen Lawson, a cutthroat Broadway diva, perfect, who fears for the new generation of young actresses, specifically Neely, played by Patty Duke, whom Helen suspects an all-about-Eve situation going on. But Broadway doesn't go for booze and dope, and she'll do whatever it takes to crush her spirit and destroy her career with class, right? This role was famously going to be played by the one and only Judy Garland, but also Ginger Rogers at one point. But as covered in my video on Judy, her illness was still affecting her behavior. So off Judy went and Susan Hayward literally jumped in. Her character was based off of Ethel Merman, apparently, which the author Jacqueline had experience working with. And it's funny how Neely is based off of Judy Garland. You can honestly say Susan Hayward was coming back from turning down the role of Margot Channing in All About Eve. So this was perfect timing, wasn't it? The film was supposed to be set during the 40s as it was originally written, but they updated it to be taking place during the time it was made in the late 60s, where the production studios were falling apart, which I believe adds to its captivating effect. And I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. Even though all Susan's scenes are so few, she steals the damn show. <laughs> one of her best moments, you know it is, is when she sings, Oh, I'll plant my own tree, my own tree, and I will make it grow. I, I wish I could sing it because I just can't do it justice, like Susan Hayward did. It's so iconic to underground audiences everywhere, even though she was dubbed by Margaret Whiting. This also showcases the great professionalism Hayward still retained by the making of this film for the famous wig snatching scene, revealing Helen's white hair underneath her wig, Patty Duke grabs. The studio was willing to make her wear a white hair wig, but Susan said it only made sense to have her hair dyed white, so it looked natural. And so she did, and it's a beautifully committed action on Hayward's part to give herself to the scene. All in all, Valley of the Dolls remains a popular one for fans of Sharon Tate, Patty Duke, Lee Grant, and especially Susan Hayward. Number five, My Foolish Heart. Yes, a passionate classic and a favorite among Susan Hayward fans indeed, for it features her second Academy Award nominated performance for Best Actress. She plays Eloise, an alcoholic, unhappy housewife with a daughter visited by her friend Mary Jane. And Eloise lets open the frustration and misery she's going through and then recounts the lost love that got away. Walt, played by Dana Andrews, directed by Mark Robeson in his collaboration with Hayward for the first of two times. This movie is indeed a four handkerchief soapy soap opera of a film. But that certainly doesn't mean it loses any merit. Critics at the time of its release thought it was void of any merit. But today, it's well regarded by classic film lovers just like you. Oscar winning actress Teresa Wright was originally cast as Eloise, but due to a feud between she and Sam Goldwyn, Susan Hayward was brought in last minute. And hey, things happen for a reason, don't they? Hayward adds just the right amount of sentimentality to the role that we care deeply of what happens to her. Though the film is quote unquote, a bastardized version of J.D. Salinger's short story, Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut, Susan Hayward gives it enough weight to lure us in and enjoy every teardrop from her performance. Number four, with a song in my heart. This patriotic melodrama is brought to great acclaim and life because of the heart and soul of Susan Hayward in her third Academy Award nominated performance for Best Actress. We have the one of many biopics with Susan Hayward playing real life singer Jane Froman who rose to fame over the radio with her gorgeous voice. And once she marries her accompanist, Don Ross, she travels overseas to perform for the troops during World War II. But her plane crashes, injuring her legs, where she meets another soldier and thus stirring the pot on a love triangle. Nominated for five Oscars total and winning one for best score, this picture was a great box office success and a great success for Susan giving it such a lighter flair, but earning the dramatic shifts within the story. Jean Peters and Jean Crane were apparently approached to play the role, but Froman herself 
chose Hayward since she felt she best resembled the iconic singer. Froman didn't step away completely since she dubbed Hayward singing here. Hayward just shows the world how versatile she can be with sentimental stories like this, being that of a true one. Number three, Smash Up, the story of a woman. The big ball of the melodrama which earned Susan her first Academy Award nomination for Best Actress and practically made her career explode with honors critically and with audiences. She plays Angie Evans, a rising nightclub singer who meets a dashing, struggling songwriter played by Lee Bowman. Of course, they fall madly in love, but Angie is forced to give up her career for her husband and raise a family while his star is rising the charts, thus putting her in a self-destructive manner and becoming an alcoholic. Susan indeed gives an honest portrayal here, which legend has it was based on the relationship between Bing Crosby and his wife Dixie Lee when Bing's star was rising. Dixie fell into alcoholism, like Susan here. Co-written by Dorothy Parker, who co-wrote pieces of the classic A Star Is Born. You can see the parallels in that story which here was also Oscar nominated for Best Story. The story itself takes an awful long time, as if we sit in Angie's drunken bliss and curse longer than expected, which could make the film drag. But Susan's magneticism keeps it from totally falling to the ground, of course. The film itself is always remembered for its iconic catfight between Susan and Marsha Hunt, which in Marsha Hunt's testimony, Susan did not hold back. All in all, for Susan Hayward fans, the film marks one of her greatest iconic moments in film, which made her a real star of the ages. Number two, I'll Cry Tomorrow. Yes, why not another story about a sensitive yet strong woman who has a promising career but comes to deep challenge by alcoholism? And better yet, why not have Susan Hayward take on and completely annihilate this heavy role in a positive way, earning her fourth Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. Based on the true story of Lillian Roth, the famous Broadway star who did a couple classic films herself, like Ladies They Talk About and the Marx Brothers film Animal Crackers, Susan Hayward once again blows the rooftop off on the role of Lillian, that Lillian Roth herself made promotions approving of Susan's performance. So many others were in the running to play Lillian, including June Allison. But Susan was, of course, the golden winner. Based on Lillian's own book of the same name, this has been regarded by most as their favorite and best performance of Hayward. To today's standards, it's quite the formulaic biopic, growing up as a star with an overbearing stage mom, played wonderfully by Joe Van Fleet, of course. However, Susan Hayward makes this film so damn memorable because of how close to home it certainly hit Susan personally. After making Soldier of Fortune, Susan was going through a divorce and had tried to commit suicide with an overdose of sleeping pills. It was made public and luckily, the paramedics made it in time to save her. This film would be her next project. And Susan dove into this film, progressing her singing for the first time, as well as dancing. And the studio was prepared to dub her using Sandy Ellis, but after they heard Hayward's rehearsal tracks, they decided to use her own voice for the film and went as far as using the tagline, Susan Hayward sings. And she certainly is not bad, taking the time to study Lillian Roth's own voice. Once again, she gives Lillian such gravitas, depth, pathos, and empathy for us to connect with that you almost feel this was her time for the Oscar. But nah, that would go to Anna Magnani for her performance in The Rose Tattoo, which she's brilliant as well. But a close second would definitely be Susan for her show-stopping moment here. And now here are some honorable mentions. I'd Climb the Highest Mountain, which, okay, by any means, it's not the greatest of all films. However, this lackluster film based on the book A Circuit Rider's Wife by Cora Harris is elevated by a bit of the top billing support of Susan Hayward as the city wife of a minister who comes into the Georgian Blue Ridge Mountain town through blue screen and adjusts to life in the deep south. A brief appearance by Alexander Knox is surely helpful, but Susan Hayward gives it a genuine tone, which only makes it 
enduring. On top of the fact that Susan almost lost her freaking life while filming, slipping on a waterfall but saved by a studio chauffeur. She later fell in love with Georgia and would live there on her ranch on her off time from filming years later. I married a witch. Haha, <laughs> this hilarious Oscar nominated supernatural screwball comedy, which inspired Bewitched later on, which most people talk all about Frederick March and Veronica Lake, for good reason, since they are the stars. But let's not forget the great supporting performance of Hayward, as March's annoying as hell and spoiled fiance Estelle. All her scenes are frickin' hilarious, and it's another piece of perfect casting as Estelle that it certainly remains one of Hayward's better supporting appearances. David and Bathsheba, yes indeed. A great Technicolor Bible epic from Fox with Susan Hayward as the temptress Bathsheba, wife of Uriah, another captain of David, played by Gregory Peck. It's amazing how pictures like these tried to bring empathy towards David's plight, who is all about getting what he wants, especially when it means killing the people in the way of achieving it. I, I mean, hey, with how Susan Hayward looks in her Oscar-nominated wardrobe in this picture, how could you not? Let's also be honest in saying this movie is not the best. Can we really name multiple Bible epics that are truly great, with the exception of Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments? I mean, there are others, yes. But what makes this film ultimately so entertaining is the chemistry between Peck and Hayward. And Hayward really shows herself off as Bathsheba. That becomes one of her sexiest images in film ever. Tulsa? Yes, the classic Oscar-nominated film for its special effects, which I admit are quite impressive for its time of 1949, with Susan Hayward leading a well-respected cast as Cherokee Lansing, a daughter of a rich oil rancher who is killed when his oil well explodes, so she acquires the drilling rights of the land to build on top of the land, even though the natives want their own land, and they are owed their riches and say of their own land. Quite a companion piece to Martin Scorsese's masterwork, Killers of the Flower Moon, eh? Even though this film does a mighty job of glorifying the people who took control of the land for sure. The positives are clear. Susan Hayward definitely gives her character oomph, that it becomes entertaining to see her stand up against the native ally, Robert Preston. And they're a great pairing, I must say. And once again, Susan has enough honest moments that make it so honorable. The Lost Moment, a tense little gothic film noir featuring Susan in a spooky role, shocking as a niece of Juliana Bordeaux, played wickedly and eerily by Agnes Moorhead, of course. The lover of the late poet Jeffrey Ashton, whom he wrote love letters to. A shady publisher played by Robert Cummings tries to con his way into the house to get the letters and will do anything he can to get them, even feign some love to Tina, played by Susan Hayward, which drives her insane, to put it mildly. <laughs> Based on the story by Henry James, the film is not quite up to snuff in regards to Henry James adaptations, and the film did not do too well, shocking, but in my opinion, Hayward steps up, giving the best she can and a lot of effective lost moments, even though she and director Martin Gable quarreled horribly on set while he kept interrupting her line deliveries, resulting in her throwing a lamp at him. How many times do we have to tell you? You don't want to mess with Susan Hayward with her fiery redheadedness. Number one, of course, ladies and gents, I want to live. Here in this intense, gritty, dark, and exciting crime drama, we have the grandmother of them all, Susan Hayward's fifth and final Academy Award nominated performance for Best Actress, which she ultimately and deservedly so won. Based on the true story of Barbara Graham, and specifically letters written by Graham, Susan plays a criminal prostitute with such an edge and yet such gravitas that every viewer is catapulted to bitter empathy for her. The success of her performance certainly doesn't go without the mention and work of director Robert Wise, who with the writers clearly took a strong stance of the message that capital punishment was radical and how the media certainly takes liberties on the trial which thus was such a media circus for Graham at the time of her trial. 
Spoiler alert, I mean, it's a true story, so you're bound to know anyhow. But the most intense and famous sequence is certainly the execution of Graham, which took two weeks to shoot. Hayward found the whole experience quote unquote medieval. And after seeing Hayward in this performance, you truly recognize how much Hayward gives this character. And would you believe it? Hayward originally turned it down. She just got remarried, and after enough Oscar losses, she wanted to enjoy life. But after enough convincing from the producers, believing no one could add more authenticity to this role than Susan, she signed on. And it's one of those experiences of playing a real life character that fascinates you. Plus the 37% box office receipts, which made her a happy camper for sure. But the ultimate win was Oscar Knight. And when Jimmy Cagney announced the winner is Susan Hayward, God, what bliss. Hayward felt like the respect for her as an actor was really, really finally earned, but it always was there. It just took time for the right moment. To this day, many actors like myself cite Hayward's monumentally accurate and deep performance as a masterclass in acting here. And I honestly believe we wouldn't have the power of Charlize Theron's Oscar winning performance in Monster if it had not been for Susan's strength here. Film critic Danny Peary once said in an updated review of this film back in 1993, specifically of Susan Hayward, was, quote, the actress of that era, the 1940s and 50s, who most needs rediscovery, and the best film to start with is I Want to Live. And I second that motion, for it was the first film I ever saw of Susan Hayward, and it goes down in history as certainly her most powerful. But how thankful we are as artists and viewers to have another actor like Susan Hayward, to always give powerful and real performances, no matter what kind of bland, average script it is. We never can count on the best scripts to just come by the carload. It just takes time, patience, and hard work, and a little bit of luck, too. And Susan Hayward certainly had so many lucky moments professionally. As you can see, her life certainly wasn't easy, nor perfect. You know what I always say. But to make a name for yourself in Hollywood and make an impact on people's lives, that's another honor altogether. It's also a valuable thing to volunteer and help the soldiers during World War II as she did, to then give her life to her loving family. Legend has it that her sudden death of brain cancer in 1975, at the young age of 57, was caused by the film site of Cecil B. DeMille's The Conqueror, where atomic bomb tests were done. Out of a cast and crew totaling 220 people, 91 of them developed some form of cancer, and 46 had died of a cancer-related disease, including John Wayne, Agnes Moorhead, and actor-director Dick Powell. Nevertheless, it was unbelievably tragic, for we lost an actress who was more than the artist who turned down the role of Margot Channing in All About Eve. She was more than the artist who played alcoholics. She was a Brooklyn girl, an aspiring artist who gravitated toward three-dimensional, valuable works. And she gave the world art that continues to inspire us all. That's it, and I'll go out the way I came in. But first, tell me, you classic film lovers, do you agree with my picks? What are your favorite performances by one of the great underrated queens, Susan Hayward? Please share in those comments below. You must. If you like this, please click like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. And also, please, 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 my friends, do check out the Patreon page. We have a lot of fun stuff going on there. I promise you won't regret it. But until next time, folks, thank you so much for watching. I I'm so happy I could cry. But no, I'll cry tomorrow.